My name's David Millichap. I'm a general manager here at Checkup uh, for the engagement and business development team. And one of my other jobs is chairing these Queensland primary healthcare network meetings, which have been going for actually 10 years. Um, so it's really great that you've been able to join us um, today in person. And we also have people online. So a uh, special welcome to those people viewing the live stream. So to begin today's meeting, I'd like to introduce Checkup's um, pretty much brand new general manager for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health, uh, Nairi Mewitt, who is going to provide uh, an acknowledgement of country. Over here. Uh, yep. Thank you, Yura. So my name, as um, David said, my name is Nairi, and I am a Kwandamuka woman from Minjaraba, and I've just recently started with Checkup approximately four or five weeks ago, so I'm very new to this. Um, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodians of the land of which we meet today, the Turrbal and the Jagara people. I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a number of people joining us online today and like to, and from other regions of Australia, and I would like to pay our respects to their traditional owners and custodians and pay our respects to elders past and present. I extend our respect um, to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in the room with us and who are also joining us online. And I also would like to thank um, the Queensland Aboriginal Island Health Council for enabling us to um, run this lovely event in their room, boardroom. So thank you. Um, I'd like to pass that back over to David. Correct. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. <laughs> Okay, so today is Checkup's final Queensland Primary Healthcare event for 2023. Uh, we have about 40 people registered online, so once again, thank you for joining us from wherever you are. There is an ability to ask questions, isn't there, Gary? Um, so just uh, look for the comment section or question section and type that in and we will monitor that uh, throughout the session. Uh, we're holding today's event to align with Disability Action Week. Uh, this is a week that recognises the contributions people with disability make to our lives, to our families, our workplaces and communities, and to Queensland's economy. The 2023 Disability Action Week theme is Access Ignites It's Good Business. And that theme is designed to highlight the talents, the qualifications, skills and abilities of people with disability and, and what they bring to Queensland's um, business and uh, economy. Uh, so we'll kick off in a minute. I just want to uh, acknowledge Gary. I mentioned Gary before. He's the director of Armchair Medical and he's making sure everything runs nice and smoothly for us online. Uh, Gary has also ena enabled auto-closed captioning uh, for this event and following the event we'll add in captions for the in-demand videos. So they'll be released in about a week. So if you have colleagues that couldn't make it today, you'll be able to share that link with them. Uh, also joining us today is Mark Cave um, and Amy Long, down the front there, uh, from Deaf Connect, who will be interpreting the presentations for us today. Uh, finally, just like to let people know that we do have a quiet space available on level two. If anyone feels during the session they just need some time out or a break, uh, please let one of the checkup team, that's Mary over there, David with the camera, David here, and Tanil up the back. So just let one of the team know. Okay, first speaker. And our first speaker today is our very own uh, Mandy Fryer. Mandy is the manager of our Access for All project, which you might have heard of. Uh, Mandy's background is in nutrition and dietetics, and her lived experience of disability have seen her on both ends of the healthcare um, spectrum, I guess, giving and receiving healthcare. This parallel exposure to healthcare for people with disability has helped her understand the importance of disability awareness among health providers. Mandy believes that creating awareness of the barriers experienced when accessing healthcare will lead to improved healthcare access, access and subsequently contribute to true inclusion for people with disability. 
So, welcome. And Mandy's come down from Townsville to join us today. Thanks, Mandy. I just, I need to see the screens, sure, yeah. but I just, is that going to work for you, Gary, the camera? Yeah. Yeah, Sorry, that's we'll better. There we are. Sorry. That's okay. Always this good. computer has a bit of a lag. It happened last time. So I just it's hold it. Now. Okay, it's cool. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> welcome and thanks very much, everyone, for coming. I'm quite looking forward to hearing all of the other presenters speak, so I'm not actually going to talk a great deal today. Um, but before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land here in Brisbane, but from wherever people are joining us from today as well. So what I'm going to talk about is what Access for All is. So I'm not going to talk a great deal about that because people probably know about it. However, if you do want some more information, just um, put it in the chat box and we can email it or I can give you a call and sort of explain it a little bit more if you'd like. What I do want to talk most about today is the evaluation that we've recently had done. And of course, I'll talk about how to get access for all if you'd like to do it, if you haven't already or you want to pass it on to other people. And then I'll answer any questions that you might have. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to have a drink every now and again because I get a dry mouth. So what is Access for All? It's an online disability awareness course with the aim of creating awareness of some of the barriers or all of the barriers that people with disability experience when they're accessing healthcare. And in doing that, by creating awareness, we hope to just build overall general disability awareness or at least start and create awareness of the need that you need to build your disability awareness further. Um, in the course, it, it, we kind of didn't really want just to give the knowledge and share the knowledge with people and then people go away and say, oh, okay, how do I do that? So integrated into the course is some tips and some strategies to help you apply what you've learned. And we've also developed a number of resources that are meant to complement the course as well. So there's the Access for All app and that's based on lived experience of people with disability. And the idea behind that is you, uh, you do the course and then you have a go at what you've learned on using the app. So that's quite a good tool. But there's also things like um, accessibility checklists, intervention guides, client booking schedule guides, and things like that. So just basically tools that you're able to apply what you've learned from, and as well as uh, consulting heavily with people with disability in the development of the course. We did the same when we developed the resources. So we uh, worked with lots and lots of people with disability, but we also got the input from health providers to see what they would like and sort of we went to and from. So the health providers <coughs> told us what they'd like to know and the people with disability thought they, you know, told us what they thought would be useful and we met in the middle with those sorts of things. So they're all available in the course and there's a link to the resources which are on the website as well. The checkup website that is. And it's all suitable for anyone really who works in the health industry. Um, so it can be direct clinicians or it can be practice managers, health administrators, reception staff and also students. And there's CPD, CPD points attached for most professions. Sorry, so this is just an outline of the modules that are involved in the course and to develop the course we had heavy consultation with people with disability and health providers as well as best practice and some of the governing documents like the AIHW documents and those sorts of things around disability awareness and, and health care for people with disability. So I won't read them out but that's basically seven, the seven modules that are comprised in the course. This one here, I just put this slide up because 
these are some of the barriers or barriers that were described by the consumers but also are well known uh, in the literature as well. And down the bottom you'll see, you know, oftentimes people think, oh that's not working, but the, the three down the bottom, physical access, cost and wait time, and they certainly are a barrier, but they're not the only barriers. And I guess a lot of the time people think, oh I can't really do much about those things, but the ones up the top, the assumptions, the bias, conscious and unconscious discrimination and communication with people with disability and also between health, health professionals around disability is actually things that we can work on uh, and improve the way we practice today. So even just by being aware and having aware of the assumptions you make, try and reduce the biases you make and have a think about some of the unconscious biases that we might have as health professionals. And I say this from a dietetic perspective as well. So speaking from a health professional's hat, I guess, um, I just wanted to make sure that people realise that there is actually something small that you can do in the way that you practise to be able to make um, healthcare more accessible for people with disability. And so now I'm going to go on to the evaluation. So I'll talk about this. So it was evaluated by Melbourne University and they used a mixed method um, approach or methodology to do that. So we provided them with uh, the, the pre and post information data. So that contained qualitative and quantitative data. And then on top of that, and th that was 405 people that, that we gave the data that we gave the information for. And then on top of that, they distributed their own survey completely independent of us. We did have a little bit of input in terms of the questions that they asked, but not um, in terms of who responded and those sorts of things. So we didn't have too much to do with that. And then on top of that, they did one-on-one -on -one interviews with people and we had nothing to do with that at all. We had no idea of the questions they asked, um, those sorts of things, so that was completely independent. Then they integrated the findings of all of those three sources of data to come up with the evaluation results. And uh, uh, So it's a quite a robust me methodology, so I was pretty happy with the outcomes of it. So the first bit I'll explain really is the circle around the outside. So there, the different professions that did the course, and then down the bottom is other, and that comprised of disability support workers, support navigators and facilitators, not typically health professionals, but because of the interface with health, those sorts of groups of people found it important to do and also benefited from it. Probably the most exciting thing that I think is, um, Disability improvement in disability awareness was um, found to be statistically significant, so that's a little square in the, the, the middle there. And so uh, I was really quite pleased with that, um, to see that it did actually create disability awareness. And down the little map of Australia is just sort of to represent um, that it actually had a national reach as well. And up the top is some of the reasons why people did the course. Now these are the things um, that people learnt that they reported, so I won't read them out, I'll just leave it to read them for a minute or so. Um, but importantly, we also got some learnings from it as well. So over to the, the far side, the areas for us to consider, as, as in Sheka, was the accessibility of the LMS. So LMS stands for Learning Management System. And um, there was only two people who reported that they had difficulties accessing it, but I was kind of really worried that what about those people who couldn't access it at all because if, you know, if you can't get in, it's not a disability awareness course at all. So we're going to work on that and we've been working with the Australian Network on Disability on how we can overcome uh, for that group of people as well. Um, the other thing that we learnt from it is that we probably needed to allocate more time. So we said two and a half hours. People were saying it took three. So what we did was increase the amount of CPD points. And we also learnt that the reach was Australia ride wide rather than just Queensland, um, which was good feedback for us. And that's how you access um, Access for All. It's free, our funding only goes till um, June, end of June next year. So if you want to get in and do it um, for free, you've got to do it before June. 
if you need some more information or you want to access it another way, you can um, also access it through our website as well, the checkout website. And that's it. It's just a short presentation, but I'm really glad to answer any questions if people have them online. Any questions from anyone in the room? Has anyone done the access for all course in the room? Check up staff. <laughs> We've done it. And yeah, highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great course. The feedback's been great from uh, participants and the evaluation. Yeah, it's a very so oh, sorry, Devin. Yep. It's a very introductory level sort of course. It's not about any particular type of disability, so it's all encompassing of all types of disability. But there's a lot of things that are the same for all sorts of disability as well. So yeah, and then my idea, my thinking of it is you do uh, the broad introductory disability awareness, and then you sort of hone your skills a little bit to a particular type of disability or you know if you want to work on a particular area that you realise you needed to work on you can do it from that as well. Yeah, Connor just look, any questions online? Uh, no, no questions, one comment from Alison Berrigan, congratulations Mandy, great to see the evaluation results and the increase in disability awareness for health professionals. Well. Thank you Alison. <laughs> Alison was the very first project manager of Access for All, so she's also responsible. Not a comment. <laughs> <laughs> she's also responsible in part Alison, for that. Nice to uh, hear from you, I guess. Alison is yeah, working with her primary health network, I think. Yeah, um, she is. In Brisbane. Yeah. Good to have you online. Actually, Susan Dixon Grover, shout out. Um, she's a former staff member. She's also online today. So oh, she did? Yeah, Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. <laughs> Uh, okay. No, 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 no. So please join me in thanking um, Mandy for her presentation. Sorry, I'll just set up for our next speaker. Sorry, I'll just set up for our next speaker. Sorry, I'll just set up for our next speaker. So Townsville again. Um, two Townsville speakers to start um, the session today. We'll just wait for Gary to get things set up there. And we'll just get our speaker on screen. Okay. Our next speaker is Emma Lynham, who, as I said, is joining us from Townsville. Emma is a vibrant businesswoman and entrepreneur. Emma's business is called Master Shredder. Uh, it's a confidential shredding service for sensitive documents in workplaces. Um, the business's ethos is powered by possibility, not defined by disability. And that's a testament to Emma and her work. I was actually up in Townsville recently and I saw the master shredder van um, pulling up, coincidentally, uh, pulling up to a business and um, getting the, the shredded documents. Um, in her spare time, Emma enjoys modelling, travelling, going to the theatre and enjoying dinner with friends. Emma also just happens to have Down syndrome, uh, autism, was born deaf and also has a cleft palate. As a result, she has little verbal communication. But despite this, Emma loves to share her story with people using her iPad and an app called Pictello. So, Emma, I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Please make Emma welcome. of disability awareness within the medical profession. As always, we start from birth. My mom knew I had Down syndrome from a test that doctors encouraged her to perform. She knew that she would keep me, no matter how difficult she was told raising a child with Down syndrome might be. 
only days old, doctors had already told my mom that I was better off in a facility. Despite the value that my mom saw in me, the doctors did not think I could contribute anything of value to the lives of those around me. Low expectations and low value placed on people with disabilities is something I am still faced with, despite the value I bring to society. My schooling experience was a clear example of the devaluation experienced by individuals with a disability. My mom was certain I would receive a ordinary education. Unfortunately, I could not maintain the same workload as other students, and no leniency was provided on behalf of the school, so I was moved to their segregated education unit. At the segregated education school, I was not taught in sign language, so I struggled with even simple life skills. Part of our life skills was assisting your administration team with daily tasks. One that I really liked was shredding. When I graduated, the school reminded my mom that I could be put into a day program. My mom would not allow this to happen. If I wanted to be part of a supportive, inclusive community, I would not be segregated from the community any longer. <coughs> and thus, Master Shredder was born. In 2014, with the help of family and friends, I established the only local shredding company owned by a person with disabilities in Townsville. Master Shredder has been operating for nearly 10 years and has obtained over 60 clients. With Master Shredder, I am no longer seen in the community as a socially devalued person. I am seen as a strong, independent business owner with the same capacity to run a successful business, just like anyone else. Had I let this devaluation rule my life, I wouldn't be living the best life possible at 29 years age. All the things that I love, such as traveling, modeling, theater, concerts and so much more are only possible because I shredded the devaluation I have faced my whole life, simply because I look different. Here I am in Canada. I have wanted to model for many years, but never been awarded the opportunity. <laughs> However, one local Townsville company took a chance on me, saying that my craft book is the best she's ever seen. I have now modeled for Rochelle's Unique Boutique multiple times, and plan to be a part of many more shows. Owning my own home and designing it the way I want is another aspect of living a good life, something that is only possible because I work. If we are to create better opportunities for the future generation, it needs to start at birth. One breath is not enough to decide that a person is not capable of succeeding in life. I now have an amazing team of micro board members friends and staff that assist me each and every day to break the devaluation cycle. However, this needs to change. Thank you for providing me the time to share my thoughts around disability awareness in the medical profession. I hope that my life story has shown light on the realities of having a disability and seeking assistance from the profession we should be able to trust the most. Uh, you? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Emma. I know you've got an assistant there with you, so big thank you um, to you as well. Uh, are there any comments or, or questions online? No. Um, so, are you? Is Emma going to? Um... Oh, Cody has a question. Yes. Uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, it's just so inspirational. I've got tears and joy, and I've just. Um, thank you for sharing your business. Um, you've inspired me to do my business too. So we all have a gift. Thank you for sharing. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, we'll say goodbye to Emma now. So thanks so much.
Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Yes, remarkable presentation. So I'm sure you'll agree. All right. Now, let's have our third speaker for today. And next we have Cody Skinner, who is a proud First Nations man who courageously navigates life with multiple disabilities. He's a disability advocate and sole trader, running his business called Link Connection One Community. Cody teaches deaf sign language, Auslan, in his business. Despite facing personal challenges, including being deaf, living with autism spectrum disorder, and navigating mental health issues, Cody's determination to improve the quality of life for individuals with disabilities is unwavering. He also presented evidence at the Disability Royal Commission in 2020. Please join me in welcoming Cody. Thanks everyone, and thanks for inviting me today. Um, interpreter's gonna uh, interpret, I'll speak, but Auslan for first language, and I'm um, very, very proud to be sharing the joy of our language of Auslan. Um, someone's got a big percentage of halfway, but I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're all gathering. And I wanted to teach everyone the Australian Sign Language of, uh, of Australia in Aboriginal Sign Language today. Uh, but like before, I'd, I'd like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. We give thanks to God for the beautiful land, connection, trees, sea, water. And I wanted to show you a little sign I've been learning. So this is based on the land that we're on, and this is based on the Alice Rock in Louie, and we just go around and we, we bless the land and we travel. So that's the sign for Aboriginal Sign Language of Australia. So I've been a bit of history on that. We've been a meeting up with deaf advocates, and um, she's been fighting for our deaf Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rights to make it more, to acknowledge our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history. And, um, and value our culture. So that's the new sign language that, um, that I've been, and I love that sign language, especially when I do acknowledgement of country. I um, used the opportunity to share everyone the wonderful sign language of our land, of Australia, in our First Nation language. So I started off my business in 2019, um, and it's been a good reason why did I start my business? Well, because I've been to a lot of barriers and discrimination with a lot of providers in, over the years, in and out of different jobs, 10 or more plus jobs. I applied over 100 jobs in my working life. Every time I mentioned that I'm deaf or I have a disability, they would reject. If I had a job and got one, I would be ripped off. I'll give you some examples of what happened. I had jobs where I was a support worker and one of my jobs was to share clients and because I was deaf, I had hearing aids, they weren't waterproof, but I knew the challenge was I have to share the client, but I can't share the client with my hearing aids in. At the time when I went, went to my boss and I said, look, I, I know the job is to share a client in the steel house. And she said, well, you are breaking the work up in safety requirements. I said, yeah, but we can do some assisting funding or deaf awareness training. But she said, sorry, we don't have time for that. And I was a bit disappointed. And so I try to advocate myself to go to get some hearing funding from Hearing Australia. But then I went, to advocate other researchers with a lot of barriers and obstacles and no one to advocate for me but to myself. And another a job I had was I was working in a coffee shop um, and that was for about six months. Brits of skills and rent house selling beautiful artwork but I was under support employment. Um, I didn't agree with the pay condition because they said oh well, we're only paying you $11 an hour because of your disability. And I said, that's not good enough. I should be getting full wages as everybody else. And not only did our wages were a, a, just 
a dis disappointing. But it was also how they treated people at the workplace. They wouldn't let people with disability bring their talent, but everything was the boss way. And unfortunately, it had been a, a big challenge and I had to go to hospital because of distress. But on the top of other good job, I had jobs where I was a teacher's aide doing Auslan teaching um, and a ALM in schools. That was a good experience. Another job, I was for the public service. I'm now a friend with this gentleman um, and we made a lot of awareness around autism um, in, the, in the workplace. And the boss would go home every night and look at about autism and YouTube. And he would call in me and my mate in the office and said, all these questions and this is what I've been doing. And it was very inclusive. We felt we'd left the legislature. Fortunately, they cut these jobs when under the new government. And so, I, just, I ended up giving evidence at the Royal Commission in 2020 uh, based on employment and hearing number nine. And the Royal Commission have helped me hear my story, give opportunity to hear people with disabilities with the barriers and challenges in the workplace. And the Royal Commission had been a really good experience for me because it helped me become a stronger person to know that people with disability need to be heard and opportunity for the Royal Commission to help learn about the past and look at the bright future. That people with disability deserve a good quality of life, deserve to be valued citizenship in Australia. We they value to be like everybody else and, and feel our dream that we want to be. So I found a gift to start out my business. And so it's a child trailer business, so I ain't with myself. Um, it's called Link Connection One Community. And so it's based on promoting advocacy. But in, a, in my business, I also do a lot of, from my, from my experience in the workplace, deaf people facing barriers, deaf trauma, um, not assessing interpreters, not accepting um, oscillating interpreters, deaf awareness training, but I provide in my business, which I'll get to that. Um, it's a wonderful gift for me to, to do this business. Um, they could inspire me. I learn from everybody and I learn from everyone. And I want to like to leave this quote that I want everyone to go home with. Disability is a gift, it's a condition that you have, but a word, you just get rid of the DIS and focus on the ability. We are all ability, yes we can. And I always have the yes we can attitude. I don't let anyone judge me. Or, and that, I just focus on the yes we can attitude. There might be a challenge, but we can break down those barriers, and that's what we're here for. So my achievement is the Disability War Commission was really a highlight for me. I was on Channel 10 News on the, in the media, and, um, and I was on the LGBTQ News, and that was a really good highlight. Um, and one of my missions is what I said in the, fin in the final part of the hearing, that we want to see more people with disability in jobs, grow employment with people with disability, particularly deaf, first nation, LGBTQ. We want to see more people with disability run businesses. We want to see people with disability have many opportunities in management roles and to see their career. It, that we all have a gift that we should celebrate every day. Yes, we can. And we want to see that growth and be on the future and reach that target. And we've got a long way to go. But this is why I do my business, to change the awareness of deaf rights and people who are deaf and hard of hearing, but also open the workplace to be more thinking outside the box by making it more inclusive, more diversity and not. So the mission values we are equal to provide inclusive advocates, empowering and driving positive change in our communities. So that's the mission that we provide in our business. From based on my life experience that I've had, um, discrimination and barriers and rejection, it's now time for a change. And that's what I'm striving for. 
So what do I do? I, what do I do in my business? Well, I do uh, First Nation training. So First Nation, we cover a lot of stuff with uh, culture trauma, um, First Nation languages. What is the um, acknowledgement and, and welcome to the country? We talk about the Aboriginal history, the land rights, um, how to re create reconciliation action plan in businesses with First Nation, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and we try and make the workplaces more open and more diversity and inclusive for and close that the barriers and close the gap. So I'm a First Nation man from Bidja, which is out in Western Queensland, and it came from my father. So um, and between Jean Jarnival and Longwich, that's my Aboriginal tribe. So I'm very passionate about First Nation communities, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and we're always fighting for their rights to make sure that we have a bright future and we move on and um, make sure that we're all being heard. I also do in my business is deaf awareness training, and that's the training where we cover a lot of things around deaf culture. So we talk about why Auckland our first language. We talk about um, deaf values, um, like for example, deaf is a deaf person, we don't use the word hearing impaired. Uh, we talk about deaf and their deaf, deaf pride. But we also in that training we talk about um, us, how do we get um, assessing workplaces to do or understand deaf people when it comes to communication. So for example, tapping on, to get people's attention, flashing the lights on and off, um, Samping and that just try and educate people more of this is how we communicate, this is our value, this is our culture, um, and that's how we sort of um, get the employees and businesses to understand it rather than and that. Because we, some people think tapping is appropriate, but in the deaf community, we tap to get attention. Everything's on the top, and that's. We also talk about technology, because a lot of people think we just have hearing aids, and there's more to that. Like, Deaf smoke alarms, the flashing smoke alarms, um, these flash video doorbells, um, cochlear implant, Bluetooth technology, um, there are all other things in, in that. So we talk about more of the technology to, so business can apply for funding to the NDIF package or the EAF. I've also run um, Auslan Pope Workshop. So that's a 10 week program where, and I've got the flyer, so help yourself to that. Starting in 2024, I'll be running a 10-week Auslan program. Um, it'll be at coffee shops. The reason why we put it at coffee shops is because we want to make the community more inclusive, get people more in the deaf community. We could we are struggling to get interpreters, so people might want to become an interpreter and down in the long term. And so we want to break those barriers and so get people into the deaf world and learn our proud language that we've been using over the years. And I also do some public speaking and guest speaking at seminars, conferences. And the other thing I do is provide by general advocacy. But I mainly focus on Aboriginal Coast Strait Islander and deaf uh, and hard of hearing and that. To, to make that more inclusive. Next one. So these are my contact details. I have a Facebook page and a link and a link in. Um, we're going to create a link in the last couple of weeks, so we are trying to grow that. Um, feel free to contact me anytime. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm striving for change and make it a more inclusive future <coughs> for people with disabilities to stop based accessing discrimination and, and block barriers that we face and find that gap. That's, and remember, disability is a condition that you have. But the word ability, yes we can. And we all have a gift that we bring to the world today. So, you know, we appreciate that we all have a gift and all come from God. And um, we appreciate and we look at the gift. So, like for example, deaf people, Auslan, our sign language, we're very loving of our languages and we use that to communicate. So, always use a gratitude and your disability rather than, you know, we show that what you have to the world, a gift. And that's what I remind myself. And I'd like to acknowledge too a Sunday Disability World International Disability Day. And I'd like to acknowledge that people with disability who are around the world um, who have strived to success and their stories and sharing 
um, their talents and time and opportunity to bring to the world some miracles happen and proving the odds that you can be uh, you can live independent to get your driver's license and go to uni run a business and this is what I am I want to show you example so yeah thank you very much and thank you for letting me speak today so we have some questions Connor, we'll go online first. No questions online. Any questions or comments from anyone in the room? We'll go here. Thank you, Cody. That was um, very inspiring talk. I'm really interested in the First Nation sign language, where it, you said it, is that, um, oh yeah, can you tell me more about it? I said that's a totally new thing to me. Is that um, a very ancient language, or is it a newer one? Yeah, that's a really good question to ask. Um, so, First Nation is being an, uh, organised by Deaf Aboriginal Australia. They're based in Adelaide. So I, I regularly get in contact with them. I go to a workshop, I get involved, and um, and she sort of advocate and teach us about the culture trauma, like the sorry day, and try and make it more in the culture con con accepting rather than, because in the past, we've used Australia, and a lot of uh, First Nation people found it very offensive and trying to understand their culture trauma and, uh, and that's why we have the special, we're trying to change it from into the general outline, um, but that's a lot of movement into getting approval and that, but um, there's an organisation called Deaf Australia and she actually taught us all of these things and, and that's what I'm learning and the reason why we do put it in their perspective is to, to close that gap and understand the culture trauma and generation trauma and that. So that is what it's designed for, to make it more so that Perth Nation can be accepting and not affecting their flat pass. Yeah. Okay, no further questions, I think. So please join me once again in thanking Cody. Thank you very much. I feel free to take my business card and the, um, the fly for an Auckland workshop for next year. And Cody, um, you you found uh, Emma very inspiring um, when you made that comment at the end of her presentation and I'm sure yeah. we all felt exactly the same way about your presentation. So once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cody. Okay. Our... Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dinesh uh, Palapana, uh, OAM. Dinesh is a doctor, a lawyer, a researcher and a disability advocate. He was the first quadriplegic medical intern in Queensland and the second person to graduate medical school with quadriplegia in Australia. As a result of his injury and experiences, Dinesh has been an advocate for inclusion and is a founding member of Doctors with Disabilities Australia. Dinesh works in the emergency department at the Gold Coast University Hospital and is a senior lecturer at Griffith University and adjunct research fellow at the Menzies Health Institute of Queensland. Dinesh was also uh, the 2021 Queensland Australian of the Year and about 12 months ago Dinesh joined us on video link um, from the Gold Coast um, but it really felt like he was in the room that day. I've never quite had that experience where someone presented online where it felt like they were actually in the room with us. But today, you are actually in the room with us, uh, which is a real privilege for us. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dinesh. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks so much for uh, having me today and uh, inviting me to spend some time with you. Uh, and just listening to the speakers before, it just felt like a continuum of things that resonated with me. Uh, listening to Mandy at the start and Alison, who are two very special people that uh, I have a lot of time for. And I can't think of uh, anyone better to have put the Access for All program together and to bring it out. They're so passionate and amazing. And I think uh, the community is lucky to have you around. 
and then to uh, listen to Emma as well. That was, you know, it's you hear these threads all the time running across our stories. I was uh, with a good friend uh, a little while ago and we were talking and uh, he said something really heartbreaking to me. It was that, you know, when I was born, the doctor apologized to my mum. And uh, he said, so I was, I was born with an apology. Uh, he's gone on to do, do some amazing things and uh, he is a figurehead in Australian history now. But just to think that a child could be born that way. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing we, we need to change, right? That's, the, that's what we're trying to do. And then I was uh, seeing the Emma's thoughts about her mum as well. So for me, my mum has been a big part of this journey. Um, and I think the people around us really matter. Our family matters. Our loved ones matter. And uh, I see parents all the time with their kids trying to fight for them, trying to give them the best. It's, acknowledge, it's important to acknowledge when we talk about disability and the journeys that people have, uh, that the people around them, like their parents and family matter as well. And then Cody too is uh, quite timely because I just got back from Darwin on Tuesday night and I got to see a lot about, uh, I, I just felt like I, I visited real Australia in the Northern Territory because it's what you actually imagine Australia to be like when you... I wasn't born an Australian. Uh, we moved here when I was 10 years old. And so the stories that I heard about Australia and the landscape and the nature and the culture, uh, I felt like I got to touch that for the first time. And I think it's a very special thing that you do uh, to, to bring that and include that into the community. I, uh, I think... I feel very lucky to have been on this journey, uh, even though it hasn't been easy, even though it's been challenging along the way. Uh, every day still I wake up feeling grateful for all the things that I have and for the opportunities that I've been given. Uh, and I uh, think I, I want to start off with one thing. Despite the challenges that we have uh, and the things that we're trying to make better here as a community in our shared work together. I think it's uh, important for us to spare a thought for the many millions around the world who will never have the same opportunities that we do for uh, a better life, for inclusion or even survival. And I say this because I was born in a country that was ravaged by war for 30 years. I lived through that war. I uh, grew up amongst kids who were so poor, who didn't have clothes or shoes or a house. And after I had this injury, which caused the spinal cord injury, uh, I went back to my country of birth. And I worked with some people with spinal cord injury. And I remember a comment from the doctor uh, that looked after them in this tiny little space without much resources. Uh, and uh, he said, you know, it's uh, sad, but many of these people are going to go home and in a couple of months, they'll be dead. And that's because in uh, the rural part of that country, there is no medical care, there's no support services, there's no wheelchair, and uh, they will inevitably pass away. So some of the people that we got to know during that time there, we never heard from again. And I always wonder, I live, uh, I'm, the, I'm the same human being, but I have the privilege of living on the other side of the world. And by virtue of that, I have a wheelchair, I can get up in the morning, I can choose what I eat, I get to do a job that I like. But I think um, when we have these conversations and when we fight to make things better, 
I think we have to realize the gifts that we've been given and how lucky we are and the responsibility we have to make as much as we can with what we've got for the billions of people that will never have that opportunity. But uh, after moving here um, in uh, 1994 at the age of 10, I've uh, been fascinated by Australia uh, ever since then. It's coming up to 30 years now. And I've had so many good opportunities. I am a doctor today. I'm going to work straight after this, but uh, to a job I love. I love this job and it feels so purposeful. It feels uh, so privileged to do this, to play a small role in another human being's journey through something hard. And um, something Emma said earlier resonated with me so much because she said, the medical profession is the one that we should be able to trust the most. And uh, every day when I go to work, I'm, I'm cognizant of that fact. But uh, I, I didn't find medicine for the longest time, actually. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to do out of high school. I ended up studying law, not far from here, actually, at QUT. And uh, I had depression when I was studying law. Depression is one of the hardest things I've ever experienced. Uh, and for me, it was actually a lot more paralyzing than the spinal cord injury had been. Because when I was running around in my own mind, when I was so anxious, when I was too scared to leave my house, when every day was not as beautiful as this, but dark and cloudy and scary, and when I was only seeing the worst, I couldn't do anything. I uh, struggled at university. I struggled with relationships. I struggled to go outside the house. I struggled to do the simplest things in my life. But today I feel more free and capable than ever. And it's uh, taught me a little bit about this concept of disability, right? Because I now have a spinal cord injury, but uh, I think I was far more disabled when I had depression. So comparing those two things uh, has just made me realize what, what disability really is. Now I've done so many things after the spinal cord injury happened. I flew a plane last year. I've uh, been a model at Australian Fashion Week. Next Tuesday, I'm going parasailing. I've skydived, I've done all this stuff. Uh, but before the spinal cord injury, I've never done any of these things. So what is disability really? Uh, but um, that journey through depression is what actually led me to medicine because I started to see a doctor. There's a lesson about medicine that someone taught me uh, a few years ago. And that lesson has stayed with me for a long time. It was that our job as a doctor is not to treat a disease that a person has. Our job as a doctor is to help a person who has a disease. And those two things are so different. For so long, in our healthcare system, we've created provider-centered systems. But we need to start shifting that towards person-centered systems. Because why are we actually here? We're here for the person. They are the purpose of our efforts and work. All these things that have been created here, access for all, all the things that we do is for the benefit of a person. Billions of dollars in investment, the NDIS, Medicare, supposed to benefit a person. And if we're not achieving that, then we're failing as a system. So my doctor was a person-centered doctor because our conversations didn't revolve around the depression. Our conversations revolved around, what do you want? What, what do you want to achieve? Well, I want to get through university. I want to manage my relationships. I want to start playing basketball again. I just want to leave the house and feel good. And so he worked with me. And over the months, I didn't even realize that I was recovering from the depression. 
uh, but I was. And uh, I finally came out of it and my whole world changed. And that's what inspired me to become a doctor. So every day when I go to work, I just think, I'm not here for the disease, I'm here for the person. And one of the first questions I ask, or one of the last questions I ask when I see a patient, is out of your visit today, what is the most important thing for you to achieve? And uh, I also ask them, how can we make this experience comfortable for you or accessible for you? Is there anything else I can do? Anyway, uh, I started um, medical school after that. So I finished law, started medical school. Life was incredible. I loved it from day one. But I had a car accident. It's coming up to 14 years now on the 31st of January. So in a couple of months, it will be in 14 years since I've had this accident. And I was thrown into this life, uh, not really understanding what disability ever was. Before the accident happened, um, I was a medical student and I'm nearly ashamed to say that I had no idea what life was like for a person with disability. We have 4.4 million people or one in five people or one in six people, depending on the statistics that you look at, in Australia living with disability. And I was going to be a doctor who did not understand what their life was like. But I was thrown into it and uh, it was a brutal learning curve because within seconds I became paralyzed. And when I woke up in the hospital, I, there were things that I never thought about. I always thought, okay, you have a wheelchair and uh, it, it, it must be hard not being able to move, uh, not be hard not being able to walk. But I woke up and over the days that came, uh, laying on a hospital bed for a long time, you get itchy. So I started getting really itchy and I wanted to scratch myself. And then I realized that my fingers aren't working like they used to. So when I got itchy, it was torture. And I was trying to reach, trying to struggle, can't move my body and I can't itch the back of, scratch the back of my head. So uh, whenever someone who cared about me came to the hospital, like my mom, or my girlfriend at the time, the first thing I'd do is to get them to scratch me. <laughs> my girlfriend at the time, she goes, you have never made noises like this <laughs> through our entire relationship. And this is what it takes. So you start to learn all these little things and uh, not being able to hold things. So I had to figure out how am I going to hold things now. Uh, how do I use a wheelchair? How do I get in and out of bed? How do I get in and out of a car? Uh, I can't control my body temperature anymore. So when it gets cold, it gets really cold. Someone asked me recently that if I was a patient in a hospital, what is the one thing they could do to make me more comfortable? And my answer was to keep me warm because coldness is like torture and uh, it, it, it's a terrible thing. So there are all these physical things that I learned about. But then there are the social issues of disability too. We heard the issues with employment. But employment is so important, right? Because what leads to good health care? I mean, we talk about things like physical access. We talk about things like unconscious bias. We talk about all these other things. But what actually prevents people from getting sick in the first place? Well, edu education goes a long way to doing that. The data shows that the higher levels of education people attain, the better health decisions they can make because you can evaluate that information. Um, and there are so many factors that go into it. But who are the most marginalized people when they access education? People with disability. And when you add intersections like cultural and linguistic di diversity, when you add intersections like First Nation, you get so many more challenges. And employment is another one. If you have the economic freedom to access better health care, better food, all these other things, you're going to stay healthier and not get sick. But again, people with disabilities struggle to access all these things. 
So when we talk about healthcare and disability, it's a multifaceted thing that needs to be addressed as a whole. But as we found in the Disability Royal Commission, all these things are a challenge for people with disability. So I learned these things, and that was through my journey as a patient. You know, tonight, I'm looking forward to going to work. I'm looking forward to being there. I'm looking forward to doing my job, what will happen. I'm looking forward to seeing my colleagues. I'm excited. And uh, I will love every minute of being there at work today. But if I ever get sick, I will dread going to a hospital. And I will not go unless I'm on the verge of death. How ironic is that? Because I'm a doctor. <laughs> and this is because my journey as a patient was so disempowering, so scary, and it has left scars on me that I will never forget for the rest of my life. And you only have to talk to a few people with disability about their hospital or healthcare experiences to hear about the violence, abuse, and neglect that they have faced. So we need to do better. I spent seven or eight months in the hospital. I was discharged, then uh, had to fight my way back into medical school. Fortunately, I had enough people to advocate for me and I got back in. Uh, and then I had to fight for the job, but fortunately I had enough people to fight for me. I got the job and here we are. Next year, I'll be going to my uh, eighth year as a doctor. And it's been good. I'm grateful every single day. I think uh, moving forward though, we, we need to be realistic and we need to face the hard truths about the challenges people face in the healthcare system when they have disability. And these challenges are serious. We need to be brave and courageous to change things. We need people to speak up. We need people to challenge the systems. Because the only thing necessary for bad things to continue is for good people to do nothing. And I know that all of you are good people and I encourage you to use your voices for the good. Because there are so many people without that voice in our world. The last thing I want to leave you with is um, in 2021, I had the opportunity to give something to the National Museum of Australia uh, that meant something to me, that was of significance to me. And I gave them a scrub top. It's got my name on it, but it was signed by all the people who fought for me, who played a part in my journey and who helped me get here. And uh, now it's sitting there as a part of Australian history, which I think is a very cool story to tell. But the reason I tell you that is because we are also interconnected. Uh, we are united in more ways than we are separated. And we need to fight for each other. We need to be there for each other and we need to support each other. And it's just about one person at a time. My mom likes to say that by helping one person, we might not change the world, but we will change the world for them. And we are a result of each other. And in the Zulu language, they have the word Ubuntu, which means I am because of you. And uh, I want to thank you today because I am here because of you. Thanks. Ah, thank you, Mandy. And <laughs> yes, it's, it's, we've been talking forever. Yeah, I know. I'll always be there. So, um, but I, 
Actually, there's one other point that Mandy mentioned at the start. You know, um, one of the things we have so many people with disability, this large proportion of our society, but how many do you actually see in the healthcare workforce? Um, so for us to truly understand from within and to change things from within, I think uh, disability employment and inclusion is really, really important in our systems. Because right now we've got here because we've all been thinking the same way. And it was once said that if we're all thinking the same, then no one is thinking. So uh, I encourage you to think about how we can be more inclusive in the workforce as well. Yeah. Thank you. At Deaf Connect, a national social impact service provider for deaf and hard of hearing Australians. Uh, Brent has held leadership positions in the National Disability Insurance Agency and the Victorian Disability Advisory Council. Uh, he is a former president of Deaf Sports Australia, as well as co-chair of the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission Disability Reference Group. Brent is a third generation deaf person uh, is married to a deaf person and is the proud father of two children. So please join me in welcoming Brent. Thank you. A very hard act to follow after an amazing group of presenters, so I hope I can <laughs> equal your, your expectations. I'm Brent, I'm from Melbourne. I've flown here for the day and it's really nice to get out of Melbourne. It's raining and 14 or 15 degrees this morning and cloudy. It's nice to get out somewhere different. I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we're meeting today and also wherever you're meeting online. Uh, it's so great to have First Nations people here and to hear their stories as well, so thank you. My presentation will be a bit of a mix of myself and about Deaf Connect to give you a, a bit of a different perspective on deafness, community, language, culture, Auslan and the value of learning Auslan, especially for children. Those of you in Queensland may be familiar with Deaf Services Queensland, uh, a deaf society that was established over 100 years ago that's provided traditional services to the deaf community, interpreting, one-to-one -one supports, education, Auslan classes and the like. Since the NDIS has uh, hit the ground, uh, the disability sector has experienced a lot of change. Many uh, companies have folded, merged or changed and in the deafness sector it's been no different. So in the past three years, what was Deaf Services Queensland merged with the Deaf Society of New South Wales and then acquired the South Australian Deaf Society and then more recently the West Australian Deaf Society to become a national service provider and social impact organisation, Deaf Connect. The HQ is here in Brisbane but we have a national reach and I think the beauty of the NDIS is that it really shook up the sector. There's pros and cons to that and we, can, we could talk for a long time about that itself but this is where we are at this point in time. We're a whole of life service provider from early intervention with children providing uh, tuition in sign language, speech therapy, family supports, right up and through to aged care and everything in between. NDIS service groups, um, group supports, one-to-one -one supports, interpreting. Uh, we're also a nationally accredited RTO, providing training and the full pathway of learning Auslan right up until accredited interpreters. We have about 900 staff, a mixture of part-time, full-time and casual staff. About a third of our staff are deaf or hard of hearing, which means we are the largest employer of deaf and hard of hearing people in Australia. So we have a wonderful culture in our organisation, a bilingual and bicultural uh, culture, but that creates an opportunity, a responsibility to foster those opportunities there for people. Because of the size of our organisation, we also have a lottery or an art union, I think is what is mostly it's known as. Perhaps you've bought deaf lottery tickets in the past. Now that generates a significant income for us to be able to invest back into the organisation. So we've established an impact team or an impact agenda more recently where we can focus on community capacity building, policy and government relations, partnerships, 
and the like. And so that's a really exciting element. And not many not-for-profits or disability service providers have that ability to invest in that way. So we feel very fortunate that we're able to do that. Many of our programs are about investing in youth, leadership, the deaf ecosystem. We're really trying to foster deaf-led businesses as well. We have a focus on deaf history, deaf spaces. These are the many initiatives that we work with the deaf community in Australia to accomplish. We recently held a deaf youth camp. Uh, we focus on also a lot of submissions to forums like the Disability Royal Commission and other government inquiries to ensure that the deaf voice, in inverted commas, is heard. As a term, the deaf community encompasses a spectrum of people. So we talk more about deafness. So there are people like me who are culturally and linguistically deaf. I grew up uh, deaf with deaf parents and deaf grandparents signing from birth. Then there are people who are born, born deaf to hearing parents. Whether they sign or not is often dependent on the parent's decision and how they navigate that pathway, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. There are then people who are late deafened. So there is no one deaf person who's the same as another. They're really shaped by their life journey and the people around them. Uh, most importantly, their own parents and the information their parents receive, the choices they had, or in fact the lack of choices that they had. And when we talk about the deaf community, uh, that really connects with people who identify as members of the deaf community by means of using Auslan, those who use Auslan to communicate. The census in 2021 identified 16,200 thereabouts people who use Auslan. That number has increased a lot over the last three census and that's been providing, it's, it's more about the clarity of the questions being asked in the census that, that garners better data. In the past it said, what language do you speak at home was the, the phrasing of that question. And after some advocacy efforts, they, we put in Auslan as a prompt. So it's not just verbal or spoken languages, it could then include sign languages. And after that, we saw an increase in the data. We still think 16,000 is definitely on the low end of the numbers. We're thinking it's more about 30,000. So there's family, friends, neighbors, colleagues at work who may also use Auslan. So the numbers are, are going to be greater. In Victoria specifically, Auslan is the fifth most taught language in schools. I think in Queensland there are some schools now teaching Auslan as a lot as well. In New South Wales they've just recently endorsed the curriculum to include uh, Auslan as a lot. So that will be taught in schools. So there's only going to be an increase. It also creates a lot of challenges for the workforce. Where are the teachers to teach these courses? Uh, there are many hearing people being employed, but often they've only done a six or ten week course and they're out there teaching Auslan, uh, much to our chagrin. It's, uh, it's, it's not really the, the optimum uh, choice for teaching Auslan. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. And just to frame things for you, we are talking a lot about disability here, and we've got International uh, Day of uh, People with Disabilities occurring on Sunday, the third, yes, Sunday or Monday. Um, so there is um, a lot of prominence about of disability in the news and in the media at the moment, which is really great and important to acknowledge disability. For the deaf community, to be honest, we do struggle with this term. Are we truly disabled or are we really a called group? We have our own community. We have our own language. We have our own spaces. We used to meet at, at deaf clubs or other events. We marry each other. Um, just like the Italian or the Greek or the Chinese communities. But we also have to label ourselves as disabled to get the supports and the services and the finances we need to access services and information and navigate life. So there's that tension innate there. So we feel like we have a foot in both called and disability camps. Also, the medical model of deafness is all about the need to fix something. But if you ask the majority of deaf people, we don't want to be fixed. We're happy who we are and how we are. Yeah, we do face barriers and challenges, but most of those are because of society, not inherently because of us. Also, technology has advanced so much. We have captioning, we have Zoom, we have FaceTime, we have all these you know, methods that function so well for us and are so successful for many deaf people out there. But when it comes to barriers, it's really mostly just about communication. If there were no interpreters here, 
I would have this wealth of information to share with you. So who is disabled, you or me? <laughs> <coughs> it's an interesting question to ponder. Sorry, if we could just go back a little bit. Uh, Dinesh, you, you had mentioned the, the, the medical staff saying sorry for someone being born. I have a very similar story. I have two children, both of whom can hear. When my daughter, my eldest, was born, in Victoria we have the newborn hearing screening program. The government funds that after a, uh, when a child is a day or, or two days old, they will screen the child for their hearing. Now, both my wife and I are deaf. Both of our parents are deaf and both of our grandparents are deaf. So genetically we thought maybe they'll be, our child will be deaf. We're not, that's not important to us as long as they're healthy. The next day after the birth, the nurse came in uh, without an interpreter, which was a, a real shame. There should have been an interpreter, but we watched her conduct the test. And then she looked up at me and I could lip read her very well. And then she said, congratulations. And then she went to shake my hand. My wife and I looked at each other and we thought, so congratulations because what our daughter can hear or congratulations, our daughter is one of us. And then she's like, no, 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 it's good. She can hear, your daughter can hear, congratulations. And in my mind, I thought, WTF? What, 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 are you, what are you saying to parents? Are they failures if they failed the hearing test? And what do you say to parents whose children do fail the test? Do you say, I'm sorry, they've failed? That really hit me. My daughter's fluent in both languages. She's been signing from day dot. And it's beautiful to see her journey as a, as a bilingual girl. Um, but the medical perception of pass or fail, fix or treat, uh, it comes back to my point about parents and families and the information they are initially given and the perspective that they are offered at a time of life, not even at a time of diagnosis, but identifying perhaps a, a hearing loss. Um, that's what we struggle with and what I struggle with a lot. I also want to talk about this concept of deaf gain. Maybe you know, maybe, maybe you're not aware. I think it's a little known fact, but when mobile phones were instituted or SMSs were instituted in the late 1990s, if you're old enough to remember that, <laughs> um, at that time, if you were with Telstra, you could only text someone also with Telstra. If you were with Optus, you could only text someone on Optus. There was no uh, inter-network ability. But the deaf community and deaf Australia advocated strongly with the telcos and they finally opened some sort of a gateway or they opened some sort of technical switch to allow that. Now everybody can do that. Now can you imagine if you could only text Telstra if you're with Telstra? I remember when I first set up, you know, I had a phone and you know, you could have Brent Phillips and then in brackets T to know that they're with Telstra. And if you find someone that was with Optus, you're like, oh forget it, I can't message you. But the whole community has benefited from the efforts of the deaf community, so now you can all message each other no matter what network you're with or carrier. So deaf gain is about what we offer in schools and workplaces, what we can offer, a rich diversity of perspective of life, ways of communicating, and many other things. So we have a lot to offer. There's a lot of value in deaf gain as opposed to hearing loss. Last year, Deaf Connect partnered uh, with Deaf Australia to, con to uh, sponsor three research papers, which are on our website, and I can tell you about them later. The first is the value of Auslan. For people to see deafness as a disability or as a deficit, they see it as a cost. But we actually bring a lot of economic value and benefit to the Australian co economy. There are many interpreter services, many Auslan training providers. So this data and this research can be demonstrated to the government that it is worthwhile to invest in Auslan and not purely to see it as some cost. The second paper was about the benefits of exposing or giving children access to sign language from very young. 95% of deaf people are born to parents who can hear. And many of them sit down at a dinner table at night not knowing what's happening in their family because of the spoken language only being used. And parents aren't making informed decisions or given enough that they need to make a good decision to navigate both speech and sign language and allowing that person to eventually make a good decision for themselves. So often Auslan is disregarded and it's all about speech therapy and cochlear implant and fixing the child, whereas the child's well-being socially and emotionally uh, seems to peter out over time. 
So a person who is exposed to sign language from the earliest stages navigate work better, get better jobs, get better educated and then can con contribute more to the Australian economy. They pay tax, they contribute. So there's an economic argument here to show the value of investing in Auslan from very young. As they grow they can make their own decision but why not give them everything at the beginning, visual communication, Auslan and speech if they need, then they can decide what they want. But So there's a strong uh, medical focus here that is uh, passing down the decision-making ability of people. There's also um, many different you know, viewpoints about the cost of, of hearing loss as well. So anyway, it's, it's worthwhile looking at these papers that we have made available on our website. There's very little data in regards to Auslan, sign language, visual communication, as opposed to the research into the auditory verbal uh, methods. Um, it's dis disproportionate so, and there's a lot of money behind that agenda, behind sort of the Bionic Ear Institutes and it's a very big business, it's a big technology business and so we don't have that capacity and so we're, we're trying to, to catch up and equalise that. We launched the papers prior to federal election uh, in 2022 and we're hoping that gets traction. We really want the government to commit to invest in a national Auslan strategy that incorporates a training pathway, uh, workforce and language preservation and awareness, training, all of those things. There's a real lack of that. It's also very fragmented, the approach towards Auslan at all levels of government in Australia at the moment. <coughs> so the economic research shows that if a, if a person is exposed to Auslan from the younger stages, they're about $13,000 better off a year. And you think about that over a lifetime, you're talking about the extra contribution being around $750,000 to the Australian uh, ec economy. The value of Auslan annually too is around $370 million. So that's a different way to frame it, not just to see things as a cost, oh, I have to book an interpreter, I've got to give deaf person an access, access. but the flip side of that uh, that we can see is that there is an economic value to it. If you delay exposing a child to Auslan by two years, it will have run-on effects in terms of language deprivation and disadvantage. Learning deficit of approximately 20% at age 10 is seen as opposed to their peers. So you can see there's many, many effects that ends up becoming a cost by delaying Auslan, then the benefit. It's complicated, there's a lot of stats there that's worthwhile reading and thinking about later, but we just wanted to emphasise that there is a different narrative, there is a different perspective on Auslan and language acquisition rather than purely the prevailing medical model. What can you and your networks do? Well, become champions, become allies of Auslan and the deaf community. Appreciate and accept that there is a cultural and linguistic side to deafness as well. There is a medical side that you may be familiar with, but get to know and appreciate the language, the community, the culture, the spaces, the behaviours, the history and the traditions. It's very rich. Share the research papers with your colleagues and your networks. Consider how you might be more inclusive in the workplace. Employ deaf people because they will bring with them a rich diversity of, of language and culture into your workplace. And you can become a better medical provider to deaf people as well. We are here and willing to partner with anybody, even to share advice and consultation. Whatever is required, we're here to partner. Feel free to email me any, any time and I'm, and I'm happy for, for my contacts to be shared and the link to the research papers as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think, uh, yeah, a big thank you to Brent and also um, to Mark there. So please join me once again in thanking um, Brent and Mark. <laughs> Are there any questions online or in the room? I've got one. Yep. It's curious. Uh, I can't use my fingers, and Auslan is so 
finger intensive. I wonder if uh, Brent has any tips. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Great question. Yeah, look, um, to be honest, I don't have a, a direct response to that. There are deaf people with varying uh, uh, situations and, and other disabilities, or uh, they, they find other ways to communicate visually. Facial expression, body language is also a very rich part of our language and the use of language within our culture. Uh, people will always find a way to communicate. Uh, Deaf people have no problem traveling overseas. If you were to go to Italy or Greece, uh, I myself as a deaf person have been, had no problem booking hotels, restaurants, but hearing companions that I've had with me um, just completely disconnect. So breaking down communication to the very core concepts to really achieve understanding is one of the best things I think also about being deaf is traveling the world and making connections with uh, other cultures. Sorry, I've gone off track a bit there, but that's just something I wanted to share with you. No, thank you. Thank you, and um, yes, um, one more time, thank you. <coughs> and to finish off, um, we're going to invite um, Nanita Smith uh, to say a few words. Um, <coughs> Nanita's from uh, Hester, and Hester has sponsored our meetings all year, in fact for several years now, um, so um, CheckUp really appreciates the sponsorship from Hester, and um, Nanita's a business development manager and would like to say a few words just to close the meeting. Thank you. Um, I actually said don't worry about just saying a few words, but David encouraged me. Um, so whilst I'm a business relationship manager at Hester, I also twilight as a yoga teacher and the feeling of the room is gratitude. And I just wanted to take you through something that I normally do when I close off a class. And that's um, normally when that beautiful, blissful state of Shavasana, my favorite pose. Um, I normally bring people back and say, you know, give thanks to your beautiful bodies for allowing you to have practice today. And I think that is something that we all can be grateful for, no matter what um, version of that we have. But also also bring to mind three things that you're truly grateful for in your life today. And so I just want to share, well I say three or more things, but I just like to share what I'm grateful for today and inspired by Dinesh. Um, so I'm inspired, well grateful for Hester for employing me today. Um, I'm also grateful that I'm in the position that I am to connect with David and to sponsor these events because they're always really inspiring. I always get to meet someone and learn something new so that I'm grateful for. Um, and third, I'm thankful for all of you. So I know that you all have ripples, um, whether that's just in your family, in the work that you do, in the way that you support and advocate for the sector. So I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I was just going to close with a few words, but Susan Dixon Grover, who used to be in our Townsville office with Mandy, she now works for Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, she's taken the words right out of my mouth, really. Um, she just sent an email just before. Uh, Hi guys, just wanted to congratulate you on, in capital letters, the best QPHCN um, uh, meeting that I've ever attended. And I'm not just saying that either. Uh, I loved every presenter and was teary in several of them. Well done, I know how much hard work goes in behind the scenes and thanks so much for the invite, I loved it. So I think that sums it up better than I probably could have. Um, but yeah, I've been coming to these meetings for 10 years, so this, we've probably had about 40 or I think maybe 44 actually of these gatherings in because we do quarterly. And I think this is one I'll remember. Um, big thank you to Mandy for really pulling the speaker list together. Well done. That was really um, amazing. And special thanks to our team as well, just for coordinating everything and to Gary. Um, we couldn't have done this without you, Gary. Sometimes Gary doesn't come to these meetings and we're, we do our best, but to have his professionalism, and this will now be available. You know, it's probably about 60 or 70 people watched today, but it would be great if six or 7,000 people could really watch today. So we're gonna be promoting the video really um, as much as we can to get it out there for people who couldn't attend in person or online today because I think a lot of people should watch uh, and learn um, from our guest speakers today. And I'd, I'd ask our guest speakers and our Auslan interpreters to, if you could, come to the front for a photo when we break. You're not shy? He's, <laughs> Cody's, Cody's ready. ready. He nearly jumped out of his seat there. But, um, I love my 
Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'd love to, I think we need to capture, it's a shame Emma's not, obviously not with us, um, she was online, but I think it'd be great to capture um, the excellent lineup of speakers um, we had today. Helping Emma, we're doing a, a panel at the, they're yes. doing a people with disabilities day in town, so at the quarter deck, so I'll... Mm, you'll see her, is it this weekend? Well. Yeah, yeah. yep, so yeah. Mandy will be up there in Townsville yeah, with Emma. Take some photos. Take some photos there. Okay, well let's finish off there. Um, there is still food and some, um, there's some cakes and things over there I believe, so please if you didn't have anything, grab something. That's our last QPHCN for the year. We'll do four again next year. Uh, this will be one we'll certainly remember uh, for a long time. So please, a final thank you to, I've got the list here, to Mandy, to Emma, to Cody, to Dinesh, to Brent, and to Amy and Mark. Uh, a big thank you.